The wave was on fire. We were being bombed by these big fire embers, fire tornadoes. Long before there was a crisis in Hawaii involving flames. It was burning around, explosions, cars blowing up, embers flying, just, just you couldn't breathe. Catastrophe, a disaster. Everything is gone. There was a crisis involving water. It's like a sword or a bomb hanging over our heads. Water that climate change was drying up. We've lived here for 2,000 years peacefully, never had this issue with water. That's all I think about is will we be able to live here for 2,000 more years? Scarce water going to tourists instead of locals. We may come to a point where we need to decide who gets water and who doesn't. And then tainted water that poisoned thousands with jet fuel. It was kind of post-apocalyptic, the headaches and nausea, bloody stools, the cats were vomiting, we were all fighting over water. And if there isn't enough water to drink, how will there be enough water to put out fires? The threat is immense, the threat is existential. There is petroleum in our sole water source. We are on the verge of a greater catastrophe. Months before the world watched in horror as Maui burned, we traveled to Oahu to see what experts were calling a climate crisis already in the works. This is life right here. And if you lose this, you, what, what do you have? I've been noticing this more. This is not common, but I've been noticing this more when we have changes in conditions. We'll have like long, long periods of no water at all or very minimal. Everything just gets so hot and nothing can really grow good. And then we'll have like one year we had 40 days straight, nonstop rain. When we get those extremes, everything gets flooded out, we lose the crop, then we have to wait a very long time for it to dry out and we can't, we can't work it. Some plants won't recover at all and then it's kind of like starting all over again. The biggest challenge is water. A healthy lo'i system needs about 250,000 gallons per day, per acre. We're not even hitting a fraction of what we need for one acre and this is three acres. We have had very severe and persistent droughts. There's some evidence that our winter rainfall has been declining since the middle of the 19th century. So something like more than 150 or 160 years, it's been kind of slowly going down. I mean, what, what are we gonna do? Bring in water from California. California is facing droughts because of overuse of water. It has gotten warmer. It's uh, undoubtedly, it will continue to get warmer. Temperature goes up, the evaporation rate will go up. That has two effects, both of which are bad. One is it reduces the amount of water that we have for a water supply, and it simultaneously increases the need for water. And so it's kind of a double whammy. Because if you increase the need for water, you'll pump more, and that lowers the water table instantly. Rainfall is, is the, the source for the fresh water. So if you don't get enough rainfall, then of course there's a concern about the, the, the fresh water supply. Some people suggest maybe by 2030, there's, there'll be a depletion of groundwater supply. Then you have a less and less groundwater to, to extract from. Then we may, we may see more wildfire okay, incidents okay, because of this drought. We are a fire-prone state. I don't think it's publicized maybe nationwide, but those of us who live here know that we are prone to wildfire. We have all the conditions that support wildfire, dry vegetation, heavy winds, more and more drought episodes, and lots of vegetation on the ground that's fire-prone and unmanaged. An apocalyptic scene. That is how eyewitnesses are describing wildfires spreading across Hawaii's second largest island. Some people have had to jump into the ocean to escape. There are reports tonight that fire hydrants ran out of water as crews raced to fight the blaze. But how does an island run out of water? It all comes down to the only natural source of fresh water in the middle of the ocean, the underground aquifer. But this idea of the water leaking through this lava rock is exactly what's happening underground as the rain falls at the top of the mountain and works its way, percolates its way through all the cracks and crevices of that rock, works its way underground. 
the age of water when it gets to the underground aquifer, which is about 25 years. This is water not yet touched by human hands. So we've come 1,500 feet in, with about 2,000 feet of mountain above our head. Above you, you see sections of pipe, uh, what we did was we drill the pipe into the rock and then fill the rock with concrete. Uh, but the concrete would need to seal the cracks in the rock so that otherwise let water leak through. All around the world, we're, we're having to solve for climate crisis. As much water as we have in, in the entire planet, only probably 3% of it is, is fresh water. And probably half of that is, is even drinkable because it's not locked up in polar ice caps. But here in Hawaii, we see it plainly, you know, be, because no one creates water. <laughs> water is, is a gift that, you know, I'm consuming the water that fell 25 years ago. The rain that falls on my head, I'm never going to be able to drink. And that's going to be somebody else's. And that's really what our ancestors understood is, is water is, is, is sacred, is precious. And it's our responsibility. We don't create water, but, but we, we steward it for the next generation. And we try to keep the systems in balance to enable for that to happen. Hawaii's water system is very, very diverse. So we have abundant fresh water in some areas where we have very, very high rainfall and that recharges the groundwater, produces abundant uh, water that's available to be recovered for water supply. But we also have some very, very dry areas and that tends to be where a lot of people live and where most of the kind of tourist industry is and where the water demand is. Tourism has really been about pimping out our people here in Hawaii. You have golf courses. Now we have the largest wave pool in the world. Why do we need wave pools on an island surrounded by the ocean in the middle of a water crisis? All of these things use and waste precious water and they're not using it to drink or to support life. They're using it to make money and to com they're commodifying it. Using palatable water in the middle of a water crisis uh, to support, you know, this profit-seeking enterprise. It's, it's just, you know, yet another example of where, you know, Western assumptions and priorities have really overtaken the understanding that the water is a precious, infinite resource. Our drinking water supply here on Oahu is uh, almost entirely from groundwater. But when, when the rain doesn't come, we don't have any second chance. We don't have any other way to get our water supply. We can't pipe it from the nearby state. Everything that happens for us as an, as an island is, is all actively gonna impact our ability to farm. All of these ecosystems were connected. Water quality and water quantity are tied together. They can't be separated. We need not only enough water, we need enough clean water. This is really one of the last springs left. The water was over the steps at some some points, so there were fish swimming right on these steps. About six months ago, we noticed just a complete drop, and at first we, we weren't really understanding what was going on, and when we saw the construction, the water went from crystal clear, blue, very deep blue color, to now it's it's more brackish water and then the fish started to die and then it became you know this sulfide gas from the mud it's an ancient place that we are we are at and very sacred to the community and, and Hawaiian culture and uh, we lose this very last one that hasn't been uh, completely paved over or destroyed devastating so that means we've never learned from all the, all the mistakes and we're, we're still repeating that, that same mistake. But you have to protect the whole chain all the way from that little raindrop all the way down. A water crisis was already in the works in Hawaii, but in 2021, it got far worse. Well, there is a contaminated water crisis on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, impacting military families. The U.S. Navy has been forced to shut down the use of two underground jet fuel storage tanks after complaints of water smelling and looking like it contains fuel. The whole house started.
started smelling literally like a mechanic shop. And then the next morning, I ended up in the hospital. I was told, we cannot give you any information. Why is that okay? Sir, it's not okay. I have hey. an 18-week high-risk pregnant wife, and you know, I'm being told, you can use the water, go away. How long have I been poisoning myself and my kids? Things like Red Hill are, are a threat to our, our drinking water that comes out of our faucet, but it's, it's so much deeper. We can't farm with, with fuel. We can't live, period. We realized something wasn't right when Thanksgiving rolled around. My friends and I were just hanging out outside and drinking the water and noticing, hmm, it tastes kind of funny today. And then when we turned on our sinks, it all smelled funny. It was all over the neighborhood. The social media feeds were blowing up with people taking pictures of their water and smelling and getting headaches and already just going to the hospital on Sunday. The next day it became apparent with the headaches and nausea, bloody stools, the cats were vomiting. I had a plastic bag over and tape and then the camping gear was over here with a spout where I could open the water and wash hands here. It was kind of like post-apocalyptic. We were all fighting over water. And, uh, there is a problem with the water that you can see in some residences and that you can smell in some residences. And so we're actively exhausting every avenue to find out what the cause of that is. There's no indication uh, that made it into the well or into the drinking water. It must have been a week, six to seven days before they said, oh yeah, by the way, there may have been fuel leaked into the water. The Navy has detected petroleum products in the Red Hill well and we've determined that that is the likely source of the contamination of our water distribution system across the Navy system. It was just, uh, my worst fear had come to pass. Instantly, we, we moved into a crisis mode. We took precautions within a week to uh, shut down three major wells that are just across the valley from the Red Hill facility. And I did that because below the Red Hill fuel tanks is our underground aquifer. And the two systems that would be impacted uh, directly would be the Honolulu water system, which serves maybe 400,000 people. Also the IA Halava system, which includes uh, one of our major hospitals too, uh, Palimomi Hospital. I'm a native Hawaiian first, and I just happened to be married to someone in the military. Like I was crying, putting tape over the faucets because I just could not believe that I couldn't drink the water, water that has been here for centuries. The system has failed us. What is the whole history? From the Navy's own records, there's at least 72 documented releases of fuel from that facility, probably over 180,000 gallons of fuel of different types that has been released over its 80 year history. In 2014, we were made aware of you know, this large spill that happened um, at the Red Hill facility. I had just got on the State Water Resource Management Commission to give you a sense for how archaic the system was. They didn't even know that a spill had happened until um, someone eventually checked on the tank and noticed that you know, there was about a foot and a half of fuel that was missing. <laughs> These were tanks that were constructed during the period of World War II, a little bit prior to the United States' involvement in World War II. They're the largest known underground storage tanks of fuel in, in the world. The tanks are 250 feet tall, 100 feet in diameter, and can contain about 12.5 million gallons of fuel uh, per tank. And there are actually 20 of these tanks they're massive. The Aloha Tower can fit inside of one of those tanks. And the only thing holding the fuel in place is a quarter inch steel plate that was welded together to serve as a liner in each of the tanks. The tanks are severely corroded. I mean, some of them less of a thickness than a dime is, is the barrier between 100 million gallons of fuel and, and leakage. So they're severely corroded, and according to the military, you know, they can't be replaced. There was a risk analysis, or a part of a risk analysis, where the Navy's own consultant determined that there's a 27% chance of a sudden release of up to 3,000 gallons of fuel in any given year. In May of 2021, there was another leak, which they initially said was just 1,000 gallons, and now it turns out that leak was probably closer to 20, 21,000 gallons of fuel. What happened at Red Hill is an example 
of the military being willing to risk American people for the sake of American interest. My eight years on the commission, for seven of those years, I asked the Navy questions. They assured me this would never happen again. Uh, this was, you know, just because of uh, one faulty tank and they were gonna come up with a whole system to fix the tanks. They assured me it was the most state-of-the-art facility. They looked me in the eye and told me, we drink from the same aquifer as everyone. We would never poison our own people. And they lied. They lied about all of it. Ninety-three thousand people get their water from this system, and it's not just military communities or housing communities. It's 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 businesses, it's civilian housing off base, uh, it's daycare centers. You know, seven public elementary schools are also on the system. So we were getting reports of folks uh, with symptoms ranging from you know rashes to hair falling out, you know, gastrointestinal issues, reductive issues. It turns out that this is all a result of, of, of toxic exposure. So my daughter and I, we developed new health symptoms, things that we didn't have before, attention deficit disorder. I'm on two new medications for gastrointestinal things and mental health issues. For my daughter, she's 19, so she had some women's issues developed. I called Tripler Medical Center, the hospital. Tripler appointment line had 147 people in the queue. I left my number, they never called me back. I just have to trust the system. And do I trust the system? No, I don't. What's really concerning though, is that in the most recent survey uh, in September of 2022, nearly 300 people were still seeing visible contamination in their water. Nearly 800 people had reported health symptoms in the prior month, uh, consistent with exposure to jet fuel. And so there's something going on. Basically a year after the, the first big fuel leak. We had an inadvertent release of AFFF at our Red Hill fuel storage facility. This is firefighting foam that contains PFAS or perpolyfluoroalkyl substances, including two uh, PFAS that are recognized as probably the most dangerous of these chemicals. We're taking this very seriously. There is no evidence that our drinking water was impacted. Officials have told us there's no threat to the drinking water that there isn't a safe level of exposure to these contaminants. And there's thousands of compounds, and only a handful have really been extensively studied. Based on the research that we've done, they're associated with a whole host of health outcomes, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, but we also see associations with prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Babies, they can get exposed to PFAS through, from mother to child transmission while they're in the womb as well as from breast milk. Children that have had higher levels of exposure are not going to get the full benefits of routine vaccinations. At this point, we can consider them toxic substances. They're called forever chemicals because they can last in the environment for a very long time. Some can last tens of years, uh, hundreds of years. They can get into the atmosphere, they can get into the ocean and travel really far distances. It could potentially end up anywhere on the globe. So we don't want more of them in the environment. That's the end of the story. We just don't want more of them in the environment. The threat is immense. The threat is existential. We need to wrestle with, with, with the fact that you know, we might have just, just seen the irreversible contamination of lands and waters that have always provided for us. And I'm so sick and tired of fighting for the same resources that I feel are my birthright. I am a Native Hawaiian. It is my inherent right to be able to forage for things I need to sustain my ohana. Why should I have to leave my home? My son has autism and he is very used to his routine at home. He knows where everything is. He has his schedules and his checklists posted on doors, on mirrors, around the house. He, so he knows what to do. This is his home. He should be able to thrive in his environment that I've set up for him. I just don't know what the future holds for us. You know, we're up against 
the most powerful military in the world, the biggest gas lighter, basically. And it's daunting sometimes to have to fight for the right to live. That's what we're doing. We're fighting for the right for us to live here and for our children and our grandchildren to live here. The poisoning of an aquifer is a terroristic act. The most inhumane, unnatural uh, thing that you could possibly do because it forever changes life in our islands. Since I started last year, they mentioned to me maybe a couple of small leaks and they're having low levels of detection of uh, petroleum hydrocarbons pretty much all over their system. It's like a sword or a bomb hanging over our heads. And at any moment, you know, something could happen, a mishap, human error, a mistake, an accident, and more contamination could be released and more damage could be done to our precious water resources. While I wish the unfortunate events of 2021 did not occur, it has been an absolute privilege to serve the communities of Hawaii, our military families, and to do something important for the environment. There is still so much more work to do when it comes to the Red Hill problem set. There is a small quantity, approximately 4,000 gallons, of known residual fuel uh, that remains in the facility. And they estimate there's approximately 28,000 gallons of sludge uh, in the bottom of those tanks. The latest schedule seems to indicate a final closure around uh, middle of 2028. I think it's far from over. I don't have a high degree of confidence. The contamination we believe is still ongoing and still poses a threat. The clock is ticking. And here on Oahu, that clock, you know, just, <laughs> That clock is near midnight. The threat isn't just to drinking water. It's to the foundation of Native Hawaiian culture that centers on Aloha Aina, love of the land. We cannot practice our culture without a land base. And if our land is poisoned, then there is an intentional disconnect there. And so we're really talking about cultural genocide as well. There's been zero protections for our, our, our water, our bay, and one by one, they've all been eliminated and covered over or, or reduced to just a trickle. We are here in the middle of the ocean, and all we have is, is our water, our food, and, and, and each other. With this whole water crisis, it's really been indigenous peoples that have taken, taken up the call and, and stood on the front line on this issue because we have that connection. Why don't you just leave? That phrase has been said to me so many times by people in the neighborhood who have left and by people in the community saying, you don't like the military anyway, just live off base and live somewhere else. You know, live off island, just get a compassionate reassignment and just leave the island. It's like, no, this is my home. This is where I'm born and raised. I'm from here. I shouldn't have to leave my home to live in safety and security. I think for myself, a breaking point occurred on November 29th, 2022, when they released the AFFF concentrate liquid, liquid of 1,300 gallons containing PFAS uh, into the environment. You cannot continue to contaminate it. And you can say it's accidental, but no more excuses. We really need to be mindful of water use at this point, to conserve water wherever and however we can. Because if we don't, we may come to a point where we need to decide who gets water and who doesn't. And it's just frustrating and scary to think of what the future holds. We've had historic floods, we've, we've had you know, wildfires that have displaced hundreds, thousands of people. We saw the flames and my, my, myself, my wife and our five kids, we all got in the ocean. This ocean almost swept my kids away a few times, but that's, we're not gonna die this way. No, and we, we're here, we're alive. The entire property is gone. We don't have no housing. We just hope for the best. Water is essential for survival, but the climate is changing, and it's making the available supply smaller while living conditions only grow harsher. Our coral reefs are bleaching year after year after year, and our trade winds and our rainfall patterns are, are, are changing. Invasive species are taking over our watersheds, and we've been in the drought. We've been in drought conditions for years. When the climate begins to shift or when a new building comes up, 
or all of those things, we see the the threat that those things are. It's been it's been hard. We do it because we don't want our children to have to do it. We don't want our grandchildren to have to do this. It's, it's so bad. It's so unjust. And um, I'm not sure it can ever be forgiven. And the reality is, is like future generations are going to look back at this time and they're going to say, how the hell did they let this happen?